Please take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll begin our reading at verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 beginning at verse 9. And let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. May the Lord bless in the reading of his word. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. God is in the, the life-changing business. Untold times he has saved and transformed men and women that were thought to be hopeless cases Alcoholics, murderers, thieves, addicts have all experienced the grace of God and seen God work a great metamorphosis in their lives. By the way, the word, the word uh, repent is the word that we have in here. The, the word metamorphosis is the same word in, word in Greek. The text we read earlier there in 1 Corinthians gave testimony that this is, this is nothing new. When he says, and such were, were some of you after that, that long list, after listing those trapped in depravity, he says, such were some of you. Now, we look back at our, our pre-salvation days. Now, some of you got saved as children, but many of you came to know Christ as adults. And there's a, a, def, a definite before and after. In spite of our rebellion, God, God loved us. God loves us. And he, to rescue us, he paid our debt that we, we may go free. The freedom, of course, is, is conditional. The gift is conditional. I must recognize my guilt and ask for God's pardon. The amazing thing to me and I, I, I'm still, I still wrestle with this, having, having been in the ministry now for, for, for many decades, that the majority on hearing a plain gospel message and nodding their head, saying, yes, I, I believe that, yes, I understand that, yes, 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 and yes, when it comes down to receiving the gift, will say no. They don't want salvation because they will not accept the terms that I must recognize my guilt and ask for God's pardon. Pardon and everlasting life can be mine, but I will not accept the terms and so I reject the gift. That's the majority. And frankly it always has been. You think about the Apostle Paul, empowered by the, by the Spirit of God performing miracles, performing miracles. And they would hear the message, and they would walk out hostile. We think about our Lord Jesus Christ and the earthly ministry, where, where thousands, he says he healed them all. And yet when it was all done, as they're waiting for Pentecost, there was a handful of people in the upper room. The majority of people, the vast, vast majority of people who had received the blessing of, of the miracles of Christ, or even the miracles of the apostles, did not believe, did not believe, and never did. Now those who, who do receive God's salvation begin a journey of transformation called sanctification. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, it says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. The end will result ultimately in our glorification. A body and soul, we prayed about, or we, we sang about this earlier, a body and soul forever free from sin, pain, and death. But it begins 
the instant of our salvation with God rescuing us from sin and its consequences. I need, initially, the first step, I need to be reconciled to God. Now, we've been dealing with that subject for the last several weeks. Let's look at our text here in, uh, in Colossians chapter 1, and it's beginning at verse 21. And you, he's addressing the Colossian believers, the Colossian believers, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by evil works, yet now hath he reconciled. He talks about what we were. We were, we were alienated. And by the way, this is the, the status of all who are without Christ. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is the status of all who are without Christ. That word alienated means literally to be a foreigner. To be a foreigner. They are not citizens. We were not citizens of heaven as we are now, according to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21. We had no place reserved in heaven for us. We had no home awaiting us in heaven. We were outsiders of the gospel. We were outsiders of the, the mercy and grace of God. We were outside of this. And we were strangers to God. Now, if you were to deal with that issue with the majority of Americans, even today, even today, most people would not say that they are, are strangers to God. Because in their minds they think, I know, I know about God. I know a lot of things about God. I've heard a lot of things about God. But that's not the question. The question is, do I, do I know God? Because if I don't have a relationship with him, I can know all about, I can go, I can read and do study about thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people probably. And know about people throughout history. I can, I can learn about, about uh, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands, untold thousands of people that are alive today. People in, in, in politics, people in sports, people in entertainment. I can read about all these people and know all their back, back story and all kinds of things about them. And I've never met them and they have a, have a clue that I exist. I can know about them. But I don't know them. There is no relationship. And as far as God is concerned, we, have a, we, are, we are broken. We have an estranged relationship. Because going back to our forefather, the forefather of us all, there was a time when there was a relationship. But it was broken by sin. And since that time, going back to our text, you were alien and enemies in your mind. In my mind, in my way of thinking, there was, there was hostility. I wasn't benign. I wasn't neutral on the matter. I was, I was hostile. There was a, a personal animosity. I don't like God's rules. I refuse to submit. I may know them. I've, I've got here in my Bible... I've been using this Bible since uh, 1985, this same Bible. I have here a Neighborhood Bible Time ribbon. It's in pristine condition, actually. It is the Ten Commandments. It's a Ten Commandment ribbon. And we go through, through this. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay? I, I, I understand that. In practice depending on how I define my gods, I don't obey that one. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of things I, I like and enjoy more than God that are higher priority in my life than God, so I break that one all the time. Thou shalt not make into thee any graven image, something that I will bow down to. Well, we don't do it quite like they did here uh, 3,500 years ago, but we, we have our things that we worship and adore. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That is not just cussing. That means that I, I, I speak of God in a flippant manner. Remember the Sabbath day to keep holy. By the way, that's the only one that doesn't apply to New Testament believers. But do we, do we take advantage of the, of the Lord's day? Is it a day of worship? 
Then we drop down to the next section dealing with our, 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 uh, the, uh, the people around us. Honor thy father and the mother. I was in youth ministry for 12 years. If I had some, some young person that, that got hung up on the idea that they were a sinner, I could go down the list and I could always get them on number five. I, could, I said, uh, because if they, if they stalled on that, I said, shall I ask your parents? <laughs> Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, I may love my parents. I may show them some measure of respect, but do I consistently honor my father and my mother? Thou shalt not kill. I haven't murdered anybody. But Jesus makes it very clear that if I, if I hate somebody, I'm guilty of murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I may not do it physically, but what am I, what am I looking at on my computer or on my phone? Thou shalt not steal Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. And we get the whole idea. But I go down this list and I say to myself, guilty, 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 and go on down the list. I refuse to submit. I don't like God's rules because they make me feel uncomfortable. And knowing God's rules and not doing them makes me feel guilty. And the reason you feel guilty is because you are. And so I may know about God, but I have no relationship with him, and I am, I am an enemy of God in my mind, in my thinking. There's some personal animosity. I refuse to submit to God. I'm not only a sinner, I'm defiant about it. Now, I wouldn't say it that way. I may put on a, a facade, I may come to church, I may actually read my Bible, I may go through the motions of praying, but I'm defiant in my heart. There are things I will not submit to. And I think ill of God. I see this all the time. You read stories about this. People blame God. They think God is unjust and unloving. There's resentment. They think, I know better. I will let you know, I have gone through four that come to my mind, major turning points, tragedies in my life. And God, hindsight, hindsight, every single one of those in the long run, God took a tragedy and turned it into a blessing. I think I know better than God, but I'm, I'm locked into the present. And when I am brokenhearted, when I am hurting, I don't see the good that can possibly come out of this. Wait and see. I yield to God. I accept his sovereignty in my life. And wait and see what he does. Was it F.W. Borum? Here's one for, for you, Matt. Mercies often masquerade. They don't start out that way, but they turn into mercies. God knows what he's doing, but I think I know better. And the reality is, even though I might claim otherwise, I don't love God. I may love the idea of God. I know lots of people that love the idea of God, but they don't love God. I, I don't really love, I don't really love the God who is. I, I love a God of my own imagination. And so I, I, I don't have a, a realistic view of what the situation is. It's not always based on reality. Because my, my wrong-headedness, my wrong thinking, my hostility and so forth is the outcome of my fallen condition. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. I think I know but I don't really because I'm blind. I can't see. I'm unaware. You know, it, most of us 
we have a nightlight or, or something at night so that when we get up to go use the restroom or something like that, I'm not going to... I'm not going to trip over something. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to curse out the coffee table that grabbed my toe. Uh, I, I have. I have lights to, to to guide my path. But as a as a fallen sinner who has never trusted Christ as Savior, I'm in the dark. And every time I stub my toe, every time I step on a piece of Lego, every time I hurt myself as I'm I'm stumbling around the dark, I curse and blame God for the darkness. When the reality is the darkness is my own fault. I'm misinformed. I have, I have bad religion. I have, I've, I've embraced something that is, that is contrary to the scripture. I hold to certain things as theological truths but I, I have a misunderstanding of things. My, my reasoning, my conclusions are wrong. Lies come in innumerable forms. And in my fallen condition, I want to believe the lies. Most of us were reasonably comfortable in what we believed before we came to know Christ as Savior. We didn't realize that we were stumbling around the dark. We didn't realize that we were embracing lies. I wanted to believe those things. They justify my position. They make me feel good about myself. <laughs> People usually, this has been the, the, the dominant thing that I hear, not necessarily from here, but general. People go to church to get that pick-me-up so that I feel good to get me through the week. That may be a side benefit, but that isn't what it's all about. That isn't what it's all about. False religion can give you that. People flock to church to get that, that, that booster shot every week. There's, all, there's that, that guy who pastors that giant church in Houston. That's what they get. They, they get that, that pick-me-up, that feel good about myself every week. But he's telling them a bunch of lies. But if I, if I believe the lie, I feel good. And so I'm going to continue to believe the lie. And so that gives me a skewed perception. I draw wrong conclusions. I have wrong thinking. I have a misunderstanding of the gospel. I have a misunderstanding of my status before God. I have a misunderstanding of my fallen condition because I've been led astray and made to feel good about my circumstances. And people lapse into bitterness also because they have misunderstandings about God. There's lots of people like that. They're angry with God. And this hostility is active, not passive. I'm acting on my hostility. It's reflected in my, my thoughts, my words, and my deeds. I insist on having my own way contrary to what God has to say here in a whole bunch of other places. I'm acting contrary to God's rules. One of the things that we saw a number of times, and talking to other guys that were also in youth ministry, they would tell the same story, that you would have young people. It wasn't all of them. It was just this one over here and, 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 and that one over there. And they would self-destruct. Why is this young person who is smart, who, has, who, ha, who, was, who was an A student up to this point, and all of a sudden they fell off the cliff, why did this person who was, who was doing well, and all of a sudden they crashed and burned, why did they do that? Now, there's a number of different things that can cause that, but in the ones I'm thinking of, that kid and that kid crashed and burned deliberately. They stopped doing their schoolwork. They started drinking. They started doing different things, and it was done deliberately. Why? Because they hated their parents. There was a falling out. 
there was a hostility, there was a rebellion against their parents, and I'll, I'll show them, I'll humiliate them, I will embarrass them with my life. Now, granted, it breaks the hearts of the parents. But whose life is really being destroyed? And some of these young people, I'm, I'm looking back, you know, 30 years later, and they're still a mess because they got angry at mom and dad and they self-destructed to, to, to bent at their parents and it's cost them 30 years later the, the, the lives they live today. Some of these grew up in Christian homes. As humans, as fallen people, that is to some extent some of the reasoning that people have in their rebellion against God. They are so embittered and enraged against God that they self-destruct in our willful rebellion. If God says do this, then I'm going to go do this. If, if I know that this is the right thing and this is what God would have me to do, then I'm going to go do this. It is a willful rebellion against what I know to be. And it results in what we have here, again, in verse 21. Enemies in your minds by wicked works. Wicked deeds. I'm putting my, my thinking, my hostility into action. I think I'm serving myself. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what God has to say. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to satisfy my desires. I'm doing what I want. But in the end, I'm, I'm being self-destructive. And he says here that this is what you were. And you that were sometimes, this is what you were, addressing the Colossian believers now, because this is the life they had before. And some of us in this room, that was the life we had before. And frankly, all of us, to some degree, even if we got saved as children, we had this in our minds. Like I said, the most, the most wicked, ruthless, uncontrolled maniacs in the earth is an enraged toddler. And all they are is small versions of us because we have a little bit more self-control and we hide it. But under the skin, we're the same. There's no difference. He says, but yet now, but now hath he reconciled. When we think of reconciliation... We think, okay, let's, let's get this person. Come on, come on, come on. Come on over here. Come on, let's, let's, let's shake hands. Let's make up. Let's get this thing right. We're bringing it right to reconciliation. You come here. You come here. Let's get this thing taken care of. That is not what this is saying. God reconciled us to himself. God did it all. Because in my fallen condition, I really wasn't interested in coming to God on God's terms. And not only that, usually when we're dealing with this kind of a reconciliation, there, there's fault here and fault there. In, uh, I haven't done any recently, but in, in the marital counseling that I have done in the past, once in a while it's 50-50. Usually it's like a 60-40 or even a 70-30, but I have yet to come across somebody where it's, where it's 100 and nothing. With God, in our estrangement from God, it's a hundred and nothing. We are the ones who are defiant. We are the ones that are rebellious. We are the ones who have offended a holy God in our rebellion and our disobedience. God gave us everything. God gave the earth to people. God put Adam and Eve in Eden and gave them the best of all possible environments. And in that best of all possible environments, with one rule that was in their best interest, they rebelled. God is the one who has been offended. God is the one that we have defied. And God is the one who provided and brought about the reconciliation. He did it in the only way that could work. I, I, I find this, I, I talk about this, I give it, I'll give it to you guys, and the re, one of the reasons I give this to you is so that you can use it yourselves. God is holy and just. 
God is holy and cannot tolerate sin. God is just and must punish sin. That's the nature of God. God, if he, if he doesn't fulfill those two aspects of his being, ceases to be God. God is also, on the other hand, loving, gracious, and merciful. And yet, because he is also holy and just, he can't arbitrarily forgive sin. His justice must be satisfied. His holiness must be satisfied. And so how do we reconcile his, his holiness and his justice with his grace, love, and mercy? He does the reconciling. He satisfies his own justice. He satisfies his holiness. Why? That's what the cross is all about. Jesus is the Lamb of God who paid the penalty of our sin. He satisfied the justice of God. He paid our debt. And God, because justice has now been satisfied, can now be gracious and loving and merciful and with that forgive. Because apart from the cross, there can be no forgiveness. It's the very nature of God. Justice has to be satisfied before forgiveness becomes available. God provided the only way that would work. This is why, but look at that. Look, just look at that very thing I just gave you. A works salvation is not part of this equation in any way, shape, or form. It does not... How can I satisfy God's holiness and justice? By spending eternity in hell. That's how I can satisfy the justice of God. If I am to receive the mercy of God, I need a Savior. And Jesus is the Savior. And so God provided for the work of reconciliation. The only way that would work, we had no, number one, we had no inclination to do this. And we have no ability. I cannot redeem myself. I have no way on my own to get to God and gain a reconciliation. What's it say in verse 21? In the, the body of his flesh through death. Jesus Christ is God incarnate. He is the Lamb of God. He paid our penalty. A, to use the theological term, a substitutionary atonement. That we might be presented to God. It says here, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I... I am not holy. I am not blameless. I am not beyond reproach. But that is my standing in God's eyes because of Christ. Because Jesus is holy. He is blameless. He is beyond reproach. And the holy spotless Lamb of God died on the cross to pay, take my my place. We deal with an exchange that God in salvation, when he sees me, sees the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see me as I am. Christ took my place. He bore my penalty. He shall see of the travail of my, <coughs> excuse me, he, 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 uh, I'm sorry, he, uh, uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. He's bruised for our iniquities. He took my place. And so it is my position in Christ, not as I, as I naturally am, but as we are in Christ. And so God brought about the reconciliation. It's not something I could do. It's not something I can do. It's not something I was inclined to do. It's something that God did, and he did it all. Verse 23. And then he says this, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, the good news, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature to all creation, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. If ye continue in the faith. This is not saying you can lose your salvation. There's too many other places in the scripture that say you can't do that. 
I mean, let's, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have, present tense, everlasting life. When do I get everlasting life? When I believe. If I can lose it, is it everlasting? No, that creates a problem with that idea. Philippians 1, 6, Being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun, and this is God, He which hath begun a good work in you will complete it. Will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 5, Who are kept... I'm thankful for this. I am kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I'm kept by the power of God. I'm not saved by God's grace and then kept by my own efforts. <laughs> if that was the case, none of us would make it. I'm kept by the power of God. I'm not saved by grace and kept by works. I'm kept by God. And going back to the greater context of Colossians, because remember, what was the book of Colossians written for? What was the purpose for this book? Okay, we have a guy named Epaphras, who was ministering there in the church in Colossae. Paul had never been to Colossae before. Colossae is about 100 miles east of the, of the city of Ephesus. When Paul was in the Roman province of Asia, which is where Ephesus was and was the capital, the gospel went throughout that whole region, and churches were established throughout the whole area, even though Paul probably, for the most part, stayed there in Ephesus. People got saved in Ephesus and took the gospel back home, and some of Paul's team also went out in the surrounding areas, but Paul stayed there in Ephesus. Paul, read this book, had never been to Colossae. Church got established by Epaphras. And over the years, the thing grew and so on. Paul is writing this imprisoned in Rome, years after this church was established. <clears throat> and a heresy was beginning to show up in the church. False teaching was beginning to show up in the church. And what he's talking about is the lure of the false teachers dragging people away from the gospel. And so it's a warning. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, the thing that you believed in the first place. You can't lose your salvation, but it's a warning not to be led astray. And he uses a simile. He uses the simile of a building. He says, uh, uh, grounded and settled. Grounded and settled. Our Lord uses this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about those who build their house on the sand and those who build their house on the, on the rock. If I build my house on, a, on, on the sand, we had all those floods and so on following the, the hurricane out east, and houses going downstream, houses washed away. Brick buildings, stone buildings built on bedrock, for the most part, stayed, stayed intact. And our faith needs to be established if we have been grounded and settled. We are anchored. We are seated. We're not moving. We're not going anywhere. And so a warning not to deviate from the gospel, dealing with the Judaizers, the Gnostics. Another gospel, as it's talked about there in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, which is not really another gospel. Any kind of religion or philosophy that's going to differ from the gospel of grace. And again, the lies come in, in, in innumerable forms. There's one truth. There's one gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he concludes with this. Which ye have heard, and which was preached to, to all creation, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, had this gone over to the length and breadth of the whole earth at this point in time? No. Has it in our day? Yes. Um, yes, you can think about, oh, I, I heard about some tribe on this remote island that hasn't heard it yet. It has gone, to, there's not a country on earth where they're not born again believers today. The gospel has gone to the ends of the earth. When Paul wrote this, the gospel had gone from at least, from at least Italy to India. And we're only talking in, 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 in 30 years. From Italy to India, and probably actually all going all further, further west to Spain. And in another generation, it would have gone to Britain. And south into Egypt and what is now Sudan. 
it, had go, it was going and going and going, and it continues to go today. He says, I am a, whereof I am a minister. I am made a minister. The worldwide proclamation is still in the, in, in the process, nearly completed in our day, going back over ground that has been lost. Paul, a minister for the purpose, and so are we. I, I, again, I know about Paul. I read lots of things about Paul. I think he's a fascinating character. I've never met him. He's been gone a long time. And you look at all the stuff that he did and how much he accomplished for the glory of God and the spread of the gospel. And we think, well, all the apostles are gone. Who's doing the work now? Well, that's, that's what you and I are here for. That's what you and I are here for. We are to, to share the gospel with those about us. We're to share our testimonies. We're to give out gospel tracts. We're to, we're to you know, I encourage, I encourage you to invite people to church. And I do that too. But we need to share the gospel. And if, you're, if, you str- if you've got somebody that you're trying to buttonhole and they won't come to church, I'll be happy to come to your house and have a Bible study with them at, at your kitchen table or something like that. Work it out. But we need to be messengers of this gospel. Somebody took the time to share with you. It may have been a Sunday school teacher. It may have been a co-worker. It may have been a relative. I got saved reading a gospel tract that was left on a table in a waiting room by a guy named Pat Fayola. Pat Fayola is a businessman. He's not a preacher. He's a businessman. After uh, a 25-year hiatus, I, I, I saw him five years ago. I was at a wedding, and my father made sure that he was there so that I could tell him my story. We sat at the same table at the reception, and I told him my story. White-haired gentleman today. Most people are led to Christ not by a preacher. They're led by a neighbor, a co-worker, a relative, a friend. We need to be messengers of the gospel. That's what we're here for. This is what we were. This is what God has done. And this is what God has for us to do today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the transformative work. Thank you for the Savior. Father, we are our bearers of good news. We are the recipients and, and beneficiaries of good news. Father, may we be messengers of it as well. Lord, if there's somebody under the sound of my voice that has never trusted Christ, they may have heard this, they may be able to cite the verses, they may know this backwards and forwards. But their lives have not been changed. They've not been transformed. What they they were is what they are today. And Father, they need to trust you. They may know about you. They need to know you. Father, may we be messengers of this good news, and may you you continue in the the life-changing business. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please.